Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this Bible study we're having today. We thank you because you've given us the love to come and study your word. But we know that whenever we study, a great responsibility comes upon us to obey. And we pray that today as we study your word, you'll grant us the grace, the love, the compassion to be obedient to this word in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you help us so that nothing will hinder us in Jesus' name. Assist us by your spirit. Grant us your power so that what you want us to do will be done in Jesus' name. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We're studying from the Acts of the Apostles. And we're reading the last part of chapter 15. And the first part of chapter 16. As you open the pages of the New Testament, you have the story of the life and the ministry, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that story of Jesus Christ is contained in four books beginning the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Immediately following after the record of the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, you have the life, the ministry of the church. And that's in place as we talk about Jesus Christ the Savior. Then you talk about the church, the body of Christ. After the Acts of the Apostles, you have the Epistles. These are the doctrinal teachings of the church. Still exalting Christ, but yet telling the church what ought to be the life, the ministry, the conduct of members of the church. And the last book, again still talks about Christ, the head of the church, but in glorified form. And then talks about the church, and then the last things that will precede the coming of Christ as he comes to reign for a thousand years on the face of the earth. As you look at the life of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, something strikes you that he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, as well as preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And at the end of his ministry on earth, he emphasized to the representatives of the church that were there with him, the apostles and the disciples, what work he was committing to the church, to those who are called by the name of the Lord. They simply expressed will be just evangelism. Theologically expressed, it will be called the Great Commission. But in a simple way, he was telling the church, You have seen what I've done. I have died. I've been buried. I've risen from the dead. I did all that so that the people of the world will know that there is a way to God. And that way to God is through me, through Jesus Christ. And you now have the responsibility, the assignment, to go into all the world and tell them the news, the story. We see this in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Then in Mark, at the end of Mark, he gave this same instruction or commandment. Again, simply expressed, he was just telling them, go and tell them the good news of redemption. Go and tell them the simple but significant story of Jesus Christ, the Savior. Go and show them the way of salvation. As he said this, 
He said this to, to all the church. And he expected that the whole church, the young ones, the matured ones, the well-established ones that have positions in church, or the members of the church that are just for members of the body of Christ, he expected that everyone will take the challenge very seriously. And he called the evangelists, as we refer to them, who wrote the Gospels, if they emphasized it at the end of their writings, it must have been very significant. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That means that the message they heard was a very significant message and on it hung the eternal destiny of each individual in the world. If they heard and they believed, there will be salvation. If they heard and they rejected, there will be damnation. In Luke chapter 24, after Jesus Christ had opened the eyes and the understanding of the disciples, Again, he re-emphasized from verse 46, Luke chapter 24, verse 46, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved or befitted Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Again, he emphasized to them that you must tell the people of the world that salvation is important, it's necessary. Without each, the assignment they have on in the world will not be completed. Something will be seriously lacking and seriously missing in their lives. But everyone will not uh, be able to know that on his own, on her own. And therefore you, the disciples, should preach repentance and remission of sin. Tell them about the full redemption that Jesus Christ has come to give unto them. In John chapter 20, he expressed it again. John chapter 20 verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me. Even so send I you, as my Father hath sent me. Even so, send I you. And we've seen in the Acts of the Apostles that as you read the Acts of the Apostles, you see the story of the church, but not the story of the church in the sense in which we tell stories about churches today, telling us about buildings, telling us about administration, telling us about the various um, social things that the church has got involved in, telling us about the influence of the church in the country, telling us about the percentage of Christians in the whole nation. Not that type of story. You see, the story of the church in the Acts of the Apostles is the story of the activities of the disciples and the apostles as they were carrying on obedience to the statement of Jesus Christ that says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it's in the Acts of the Apostles to see the details, the day-to-day -day activities of members of the church, the growth of the church because of the great things that God was doing as a result of the response of the disciples and the apostles to the Great Commission, the teaching on evangelism, or as they were publicizing, publishing the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And um, in the passage we read today, we're looking at evangelism and follow up. These words were not directly used in the English edition of the Bible. You understand as Bible students, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. The word evangelism is transliterated from the Greek and it just means simply the good news, the glad tidings, the gospel. And when you talk about evangelizing, you talk about preaching the gospel. When you talk about evangelism, you talk about that area of the work of the church that is taking the gospel, taking the message of Jesus Christ out of the church, telling the people of the world, and then bringing them into the fellowship of the church through Jesus Christ. That's what evangelism is. Each believer, or groups of believers, organized or not organized, formal or informal, by their life, by their testimony, by the message of their mouth, by everything that they do, telling the people of the world that the singular important thing, the most important thing in the lives of these people is that they will make a discovery of Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the Lord. Now you see that activity, that work, that carrying of the message of Jesus Christ from the church to the world, we call evangelism. And when the people have responded, and they have said yes to the Lord, no to Satan, they have turned around, forsaking their sins and embracing the Lord Jesus Christ, we say that they are converted by grace through faith. They are holding on to the Lord as the person that will take them out of darkness into light, out of their sin into what you may call holiness or righteousness or saintlyhood, out of what they were into what God wants them to be. They are holding on to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the one to redeem them by his sacrifice. Now, at that time when they are just converted or born again, the Bible calls them new babes or new believers in the Lord. It is the work of follow up that makes the preacher or the soul winner or the evangelist or the matured Christians or the people that God used to bring these converts to the Lord is the work of the soul winner that makes such a person to now teach them step by step. Teach them precept upon precept. Teach them a little at a time, one here, another one there, to establish these converts, to confirm these converts, to make them to know where they stand, what they stand upon, so that they will not be swayed here and there, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. That's what we call follow. The preaching of the gospel, that's evangelism. When these people are converted, taking care of them, nurturing them, helping them, developing them, teaching them, that's what we call the follow up. And in the Bible, you have the connection, the combination, that the evangelism is there, and then the follow up is there. And as we learn this from the Bible, it helps you as a believer. It helps you as a Christian worker, as a soul winner, as an evangelist or as a pastor in the church to be able to know that when you are reaching out after the people are converted your work is not finished you must still follow on with evangelism now in Acts chapter 15 verses 36 to 41 and then chapter 16 verses 1 to 10 now, before I read these verses to you, we must understand when we read the Bible what the Lord is expecting us to learn. You see, in the Bible, there are situations, there are records, accounts, or stories that if you are not careful, you will leave the meat and you will concentrate on the bone. The meat is what you feed upon. The bone might be there to support the meat. The bone might be there to tell you everything is not all meat. But then when you as a believer, when you begin to study the Bible, 
you are concentrating on the meat that will feed you, that will enlighten you, that will help you to grow. And in the passage we are reading today, you will see, one, you will see that there was a problem between Barnabas and Paul. The Bible record is so straightforward. And the Bible record and those who wrote the Bible record, they were so directed of the Holy Ghost that they gave us everything. But if you are studying the Bible and all, all that you concentrate upon is the problem between Barnabas and Paul, you'll be concentrating on the bone. You'll not be concentrating on the meat, on the food on the thing that actually makes you to grow. Of course, we'll still comment on, on the story that is on what happened between Paul and Barnabas. But the real impact of the passage is not that story. The real thing is to make you to understand that in evangelism and follow up, there are six important words you are thinking about. I've written four of them on the outline. Number one, passion. You want to do evangelism. You want to reach out to people, there must be passion. Number two, there must be priority. You see, in your life, there are many things that will call for your attention as a believer, as a child of God. Uh, you see, even in uh, you know, your family life, your academic life, your business life, uh, things that you do, there are things that will call for your attention. And you will never be a serious, effective soul winner if there is no priority in your life. The passion is there. The compassion. The desire to see people saved. And then the priority. Then number three, the people or the personnel. You might find out in your own life that if you are going to win souls, you cannot do it all alone by yourself. You know, when Jesus sent the people out, he sent them out two by two, the personnel, the team. And it's important to you to know the people that are cooperating with you, to be able to reach out with the gospel message. Number four, the precautions. Uh, do you know that there are people that have tried to do evangelism? And because they have not taken the right precautions, they have not been careful with when they ought to be careful. And they have just decided, well, I have the message, I have the passion, I have the desire to preach the gospel. And without any precaution at all, they just reach out and they destroy more than they build up. Number five, the presentation of your message. The presentation of the glad tidings. Then number six, the place. The right passion. The right priority, the right people, the right precautions, the right presentation, and the right place. Put everything together. All those six things I've told you will say this way, that effective evangelism involves having a right passion directed towards the right priority by the right people who take the right precautions to make the right presentation in the right place. That's how you are effective in evangelism. That's how you are effective in the preaching of the gospel, that you have the right passion. You direct that right passion towards the right priority. Support it by the right people going along with you preaching that gospel. These are the right people who take the right precautions very, very carefully to make the right presentation in the right place where they're doing that preaching. Now let's see from Acts chapter 15, verse 36. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in, in, every, in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. They had preached the gospel before. 
And here Paul the Apostle was manifesting the passion. He was settled in Antioch. And he was gainfully employed in the church at Antioch. To go back to these places, you know how hazardous it will be. Because in most of these places, they were unwise and barbarians. I mean, in those countries. You know, it will expose him to inconveniences. But when a man has a passion, when a man has compassion for people, he does not think about the inconveniences. He does not think about the things he will meet over there if he goes there. And because of that passion, Paul brought the idea out and said, Barnabas, we've sat back long time enough. Now we have preached the gospel in all those places as the Spirit of the Lord has directed us. Why not let us go again? That means they are gone before. They went in the first missionary journey, but now to do follow-up. Let us go again and visit. In the Greek, the word visit means and examine and see and diligently consider how our brethren in every city where we have gone before, how they are now doing. So let us go and see. This was very commonly expressed in the life of Paul the Apostle in Romans chapter 15. Verse 24 Romans 15 24 Whensoever I take my journey into Spain I will come to you For I trust to see you in my journey And to be brought on my way See the word by you If first I be somewhat filled with your company You can see it's interesting people A soul winner must have interesting people a person who is going to evangelize must have interest in people, wanting to see people, wanting to know people, wanting to help people, wanting to identify with people. You see, my brother, my sister, it's good to love the Bible. It's good to read the Bible. It's good to say, well, I'm just going to be a Bible student. But it becomes bad when in the morning, in the day, in the night, all you want to do is just to read the Bible. Just read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. There is no interest in meeting people. There is no interest in wanting to do anything that will be of hell to the people that do not know the gospel. But you see, as a soul winner, you must have the passion. As a soul winner, you must have the interest in people. And Paul the Apostle, he had that interest in people. Let's see Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We're looking at that passage from verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you. For you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel. From the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think, this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. He said, greatly, seriously, he had this great compassion and he had this passion within him that he wanted to see the people. You see, if you if you're a real soul winner, a person that wants to carry out the evangelism message or the evangelism commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have interest in people. You don't hate sinners. You love sinners. You don't disdain the sinners. You are interested in the sinners. You want to see them. And even the new converts, the new babes in the Lord, with all their immaturity, with all their ignorance, with all their questions, with all their unbelief, with all the things that confuses them. You see, you are interested in wanting to see them, in wanting to help them. That's the soul winner. 
with a passion in First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. From verse 17. But we brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. As a house fellowship leader, you will not count the house fellowship as an exome, difficult, strange assignment. And every time that house fellowship is coming on, you know, a person that does not have passion, he'll be, you know, so unhappy and he'll say, oh, we're having house fellowship again. All those young converts, all those uh, people that you have to remind every time, bring your Bible or do this or do that, they are coming again. You are, not, you are not like that. It's a joy to you. Oh, you say those people are coming again. You are excited because it's a very great time in your life when you are going to stand before those people, not just because you are going to be teaching them, because of your love, because of your interest in wanting to just see them and contribute something spiritual, something tangible in their lives. Oh, you are not saying, I wish I could spend another day reading the Bible because I just like reading the Bible. You know, God doesn't have any reward for those who just read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible without ever obeying that Bible. You know, God doesn't have any interest in you just saying, Oh, I just love you. And I just like to pray every time. You'll be surprised. God is not interested in you. Just kneeling down 24 hours of the day and say, I will not see anybody. All I want to do as a lifetime assignment is just to kneel down every time in my chamber. I just love talking to God. And God says, eh, My daughter, that's too much. You are praying too much. Rise up. And stop talking to me. Go and talk to the new converts. Go and talk to the sinners too. Because you know it's not just a one-sided life of talking to God and talking to God and talking to God alone. Go and talk to the sinners. Go and talk to the new converts. Go and talk to the people you need to follow up. You see the apostle Paul was not you know praying every time, praying every time, 24 hours of the day, every day of the year, of the, of the year. But you know, he said, I long to see you. I'm interested in seeing you. And it is when I see you that my joy will be full. And if you're a real child of God, and you take the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ very seriously, that passion will be in you. Not only interested in the Bible. You know, it's wonderful when you come to study the Bible here. But it'll be, it will be surprising to you that God will take you as... A child of God that is not serious, you might think you're serious. You come on Monday like this and you stay through for the first Monday Bible study. And then instead of leaving that after Monday Bible study, the first Bible study, now you have got the message, go and give it to other people. Oh, you say, I like that Bible study so much, I'm going to stay again for the second time. God says, you are trying to avoid something. You are trying to avoid seeing the new converts. You are trying to avoid seeing all the other people you ought to see. What to have heard, go and share. But you know, for you to stay on. And I think that um, it will be surprising to the angels of God and surprising to even the believers. If, for example, on Sunday, you are here, first service, second service, third service, and fourth service. Not because you are the head usher or because you are the ushers or you are members of the choir or you are part of the uh, tip ministry doing useful work, but just because, oh, I just love the Bible. You love Bible, you love God, but you don't love people. You run away from people. You are reserved from people. You are not interested in sharing what you have heard in the house of God, what you have heard in the worship session. You are not interested in sharing your life and sharing the message with other people. You see, that will not be right. Paul, the apostle, had passion and compassion, and he wanted to share with other people. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5. For this cause... When I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Now, when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and your charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, 
desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you therefore brethren we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith for now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord you see that is passion and we as children of God we, we have already if you have been saved you are born again you are a child of God the truth you have known take it out tell your neighbor tell them in a loving way tell them in a in a tender manner tell them pleading with them that Jesus Christ is the Savior don't make them angry and if you are talking something that is important to somebody you love you'll tell it with love you'll tell it with tenderness the person will want to receive the message that you are bringing that's the passion Jesus had it the apostles had it the disciples had it and today all those of us who have that same thing you'll be telling other people about the gospel you'll never be impatient with those sinners to evangelize you'll never get angry against them if they ask you foolish questions because of the law because of the passion because of the tenderness you will answer them those questions patiently until they believe on the lord jesus christ and they give their lives to the lord now come back to acts chapter 15 from verse 37 and barnabas determined to take with them john whose son name was mark but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas, and departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Now if you were here last week, I told you that, that a person has a problem doesn't mean that God has forsaken him. That a church has a problem does not mean that God has forsaken the church. That a group of people has a problem does not mean that God has forsaken the group of people. Now, in this uh, case, you know, they had just come out of a particular problem. These were real partners in the work of the Lord, Saul and Barnabas. The Holy Ghost had spoken in Acts chapter 13, Separate unto me Saul and Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have assigned for them to do. And they responded. The church uh, laid hands on them and they sent them out. And as they went out, mighty things were done, great things were done. And um, they had been close before because from the very time of the conversion of Saul, Barnabas had come into his life and they had continued in the world. And now the Holy Ghost confirmed the partnership or the team spirit or the togetherness or the unity between them and then sent them out to go and do the work. And they were a very good, um, really good team, united together preaching the gospel. Signs and wonders were wrought. Now before they went out, as they were going, John, whose surname was Mark, not John the Baptist, that one died before Jesus died, not John the Beloved, that one is an apostle, was an apostle, and that one remained in Jerusalem. This was just a young man. And uh, his mother was the person that had the house that Peter went to when he came out of the prison, if you remember the story in Acts chapter 12. But now this young man joined them. But this young man did not understand. He felt that missionary work will be exciting. Evangelistic outreach to foreign lands will be exciting. Going to all these heathens and telling them about the power of God that will open the eyes of the blind and stop the ears of the deaf and make the lame to walk and save those sinners. It will be wonderful and exciting. He did not consider uh, going on missionary work is a hard, hard, hard job. Inconveniences. You'll not be able to sleep where you are accustomed to sleeping. And the language of the people will be different. Their customs will be different. Their culture will be different. A lot of things will be different. He didn't consider that. He just said, oh, Barnabas, I I'd like to go with you. John was a nephew to Barnabas. And he said, come along. And he went along with them. And this young man was lazy. 
inexperienced, fearful, immature. And because of that, he went back from Pamphylia. You know, it's not, uh, it's not too bad that he went back, if he went back the proper way. From the story we're reading here, it means that he didn't have the approval of Paul and Barnabas when he went back. He didn't have their consent. He just felt, this too much for me. I don't think I can continue. He didn't make, you know, take the proper steps as a young man saying, well, you know my age, you know my difficulty, you know my fears, you know my weaknesses. I think I will try another time. If you don't mind, let me go back to Jerusalem as at now. Or to Antioch as at now, wherever he wanted to go. He didn't take all that permission. He just went back. And Apostle Paul didn't appreciate that. Then they had come back to Antioch, they gave the report. Maybe he was in the church when they were giving the report, and the report was just fantastic. The great thing that the Lord did. And now that they were to go again, John showed interest, and Barnabas said, Let's take this, uh, John. Paul said, No. When the Lord called us, and he spoke in the church, said, Pray it unto me, Barnabas and Saul. He did not mention this young man, John. Leave him alone. He still has a lot to learn. Let him stay back. And whatever he's able to do in the church, the little thing he might do, uh, because of the level of his experience, let him do. Barnabas said no. He must go. If he does not go, I will not follow you. No, Barnabas, you are not serious about this. You remember the Holy Spirit called both of us together. Don't let this young man be a great issue in our lives. Leave him apart. He'll, maybe he'll go another time, but it's not experienced yet. No, Barnabas said, no, I'm sorry. No, Paul said, Barnabas, you can't mean it. Yes, I'm very serious about it. In fact, I'll, be, I'll disobey the Holy Spirit uh, if this young man does not go. And Paul felt, if it is up to that level, I'll talk to the church about it. And so Barnabas chose uh, Mark, that's John Mark, and sailed to Cyprus, that's to his town. And Paul, in verse 40, chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Now, they became separated. It's unfortunate that once in a while some things like that happen. But we're reading something like this so that in your life it will not happen. You know, when you are married, you and your wife, God has brought you together. Like God brought Barnabas and Saul together. And then in your life you have to carry the family responsibilities. Maybe you have a maid. Remember, that maid may be like John Mark. And sometimes the decision to send that maid back home can separate that family. That's unfortunate. Because when you were going to get married, that maid was not in your life at all. You know, sometimes you are married. And while you are married, it is like a boy that you picked up from your village just to come and serve you, just come to come and sweep the floor, came into your family. And now because of a little discussion about this boy, let's send this back boy back home. Oh no, my people will... They will think that uh, because I'm married to you now, I'm not taking care of this boy. But this boy is so naughty and so rebellious. Uh, no, let him stay. No, but I don't enjoy his staying. And that boy, the issue of that boy, like John Mark, can separate that husband and wife. How unfortunate that is. Or you have a business. You are in partnership with a fellow brother or a fellow sister. And you're doing this work and then maybe you made an announcement in the church or you advertised in the papers and then somebody came to join just an employee you just employed him and you began to find out that this uh, young man who has joined us now not as a partner just as a worker and one of the partners may say now let's drop this young man he doesn't have the experience the other partner because this young boy might be related to him or he might have some affection for this young boy young man he says no let him stay no i think this boy is pulling the hands of the clock back he's um, not allowing us to have the progress we ought to have 
and then because of that boy these two partners in business they may separate how unfortunate that is in the church the same thing that God is doing the work but because of a little thing and uh, we say now zonal leader this area leader it doesn't have enough experience it might be better if you just uh, let him be maybe a house fellowship leader instead of an area leader oh no oh no he is in our zone i know him very well no but he doesn't have the experience he's not doing the work well just remove him from being an area leader no i'm sorry i don't think i can do that if uh, you insist that i remove him then remove me as well and then i will choose him i will go and do another thing brother is not as hard as that don't let john mark cause a serious problem God will use John Mark in his own way. When he gets more experience, when he has learned all that he ought to learn, and so it's a lesson for us that when we know that somebody is not having experience and your partner in marriage, your partner in business, your partner in church work is making the suggestion, why not drop this individual? Don't let that cause a great issue love one another and let the work of the lord the evangelism the follow-up or whatever it is the lord wants us to do let it continue in proverbs chapter 25 proverbs chapter 25 verse 19 confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint I believe that's what Paul was thinking about, that to have confidence in this young man who has been so unfaithful in the time of trouble, it will be like a broken tooth. And the pain will be so much while we're on the missionary journey, while we are preaching the gospel, that it will be nothing that pain. Or it will be like a foot out of joint. While we're trying to run a race, you have a foot that is out of joint you'll not be able to run that race and confidence in this young man who is lazy and fearful and inexperienced and immature will be just like a foot like that out of joint but Barnabas went away now you some people ask a question they said was Paul right from the accounts were given in the Bible Paul was right because the Holy Spirit was on Paul's side giving us a record of the progress of the follow-up work and we're not given anything about Barnabas and John Mark about what they went to do in Cyprus the Holy Spirit did not take any interest to give us a record oh you might say maybe that is because um, they, they didn't go to do the follow-up they just went on a place no not like that you know when the church was scattered in Acts chapter 8 Philip went to Samaria without any any call as such just because the call had been there in matthew chapter 28 mark chapter 16 luke chapter 24 john chapter 20 the call had been there for every believer and as it was scattered abroad they preached everywhere and great details were recorded about the work that philip did if some miraculous things happened if signs and wonders followed if many people were converted where barnabas had gone and um, where john mark had gone the record would have been there but no record and the church also was on the side of paul and he said paul you know it's a great loss for you to lose a friend a partner like barnabas but the work must be done they encouraged him they commended him to the grace of god and he chose silas and the church did not commend or recommend Barnabas and John Mark. So they had a new missionary team. Let's now come to Acts chapter 16 from verse 1. Then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus or Timothy, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed his father was a Greek which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium him Paul him would Paul have to go forth with him 
Uh, you see, people might think that maybe Paul was a lone ranger. He liked to be alone. No, not at all. If he liked to be alone, he wouldn't have accepted Silas. And when he got to this new place, he saw a disciple called Timothy that was um, well recommended by the church. And Paul would have him to go with the team. The Spirit of God registered a witness in Paul that that man, that young man has the calling of God in his life. Let him follow. He will learn a lot and he will do a lot. And two circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. For they knew all that his father was a Greek. Now because Paul knew that this man would be ministering to the Jews, he allowed him to be circumcised. Not as a means of salvation. He was already saved. He was already a child of God. Well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. But because the Jews will not receive the gospel from this man, if they knew that the mother was a Jewess, and yes, she, he wasn't circumcised, he said, unto the Jew, I'm like a Jew. Unto the Gentile, I'm like a Gentile. Unto the barbarian, I'm just like one of them, so that I can gain the more. That's the precaution. He was very wise. So he can preach the gospel. Now from verse 4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees. For to keep that were ordained of the apostles and the elders which were Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. They presented the writing that had been made in Acts chapter 15 when they settled on this circumcision um, issue as the means and the foundation of salvation. When they said, Don't let us put a yoke or a burden upon all these uh, people. Just tell them that they have sinned from fornication, from blood, from things tangled, and from idols. If ye do, fare ye well. And so they presented these things, and then the churches, they were established. They were confirmed in the faith, and they increased in number daily. There was a fantastic growth as a result of the follow-up work they were doing. Now from verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia, and the region of Galatia, and were forbidding of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they are said to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered or permitted them not. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia. And prayed him or pleaded with him saying come over into Macedonia and help us and after he had seen the vision immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them now as they were making the progress in the work they needed to know the right place that is they needed to know the people that were being prepared by god who were ready oh you you said but i thought we should evangelize everywhere yes evangelism is like gathering fruit out of a tree out of the top of the tree some of the fruits are ripe some of the fruits are not ripe on the edge and when you try to gather those fruits before they arrive you do a lot of havoc and uh, Paul the Apostle did not know that naturally speaking. Paul the Apostle could not recognize that. And therefore he tried to go into Asia. But the Holy Spirit knowing that the harvest there is not ripe yet. For him to throw in the sickle and to begin to harvest. He told him not yet. Then when he said not yet he went to another place. Again the Lord said not yet. Then he passed over. And while they were thinking, where do we go now? If it's not yet for this area, not yet for that area, where do we go now? Then he saw a vision by nine. And somebody said, come over, we are ready. Into Macedonia, the people are eager. If you'll come at this time, you'll have the maximum response. And then they gathered from that, that the Lord was saying, the people of Macedonia are ready. Now, concerning the places that the Holy Spirit said, not yet, at a later time, they were ripe for the preaching of the gospel. Look at Mark, um, Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 10. 
and this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks if you turn back to Acts chapter 16 verse 6 now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia because they were not ready yet they were forbidden to preach the word in Asia but as time went on they became ready and the Lord permitted Paul and the team to go back to that same place spent two years um, consecutively there and then they preached the word in Asia and many many people heard the word of the Lord all the people in Asia they heard and many were saved then looking at the next verse after they were come to Mysia they assayed they attempted the endeavor to go into Bithynia and the Spirit of God suffered them not Bithynia again now why was that because they were not yet ready there at a later time they became ready in Bithynia and the gospel was preached unto them look at first Peter chapter 1 first Peter chapter 1 verse 1 Paul Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus Galicia Cappadocia Asia and Bithynia you see that same place they were ready eventually and the preaching the preaching of the gospel went on there when they were ready elect to the according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through uh, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ grace unto you and peace be multiplied blessed be the God and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time so the people of bithynia eventually heard the preaching of the gospel and they responded and this epistle of uh, peter the first epistle was directed to them among many other people now we've learned a lot that the new testament ministers were always attentive to the leading of the holy spirit so that the holy spirit could direct them to where ministration was needed at the time we have learned today that the lord wants us to be obedient take the gospel to the regions beyond start in your community tell them of the good news of salvation tell them of what the lord can do what the lord has been doing and as you do when they are getting saved you follow them up if you're a visitation worker you be, be very serious about your visitation and the follow-up make sure that you have the passion and make sure that you are doing the right thing in the right place and that as you are um, in the church or part of the church the work of evangelism and follow-up is very very close to your hand we close with psalm 68 psalm 68 we're reading verse 11 the lord gave the word great was the company of those that published it the lord gave the word and all the people that heard that word a great company all of them without any exception they published it they proclaimed it oh you might say since there um, were so many here and other people are already doing the evangelism other people are already telling about jesus christ how people can be saved you may say i don't need to do it because the soul winners the evangelists and the preachers there are too many no the lord has given us the word and the moment you receive that word the moment you are saved and you are born again you begin to tell your testimony and the little bible you know you begin to tell them for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life if they ask any question that you cannot answer just tell them what you know and lead them to pray to know that jesus christ is the savior 
whether you are a worker or you are not a worker the great company the members of the church great was the company of those that published it at every opportunity but tell the gospel news lovingly and tenderly with compassion with with um, with kindness and tell the gospel news in a patient way that the people that see you see your life listen to your message they want to have jesus christ as their personal savior the lord gave the word great was the company of those that published it i believe that as you reach out to other people the lord will assist you by his spirit and he will make them to respond to the gospel preaching in jesus name don't be lazy don't be afraid don't uh, shirk your responsibility tell the story of redemption and tell sinners they can come to the lord and get saved after they are saved don't be lazy keep on following them up until they're established in the faith in the church with you let's rise up and pray give yourself to the lord it's an important assignment it's an important work preach the gospel at every opportunity to your neighbors that are not saved yet don't give any excuse tell the story of redemption give your testimony to people oh don't say I'm not a worker this is for every child of God every child of God tell them of the love of Jesus tell them of the grace of God tell them of the death of Jesus Christ for us tell them the good news not to condemn but to save not to criticize them but to help them to know the Lord tell it and tell it and tell it over again and when they have started coming to the church with you or when they have given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ follow them up follow them up visit them visit them over and over again do it in love Whatever else you are doing in the church, you must do evangelism. It's not enough to just be in the choir. It's not enough to just be an usher. It's not enough to just be a worker. It's not enough to be doing any other thing. Evangelism is part of your responsibility. And follow-up is also very important and essential. Do it. Don't give any excuse. Say, I'm still learning the Bible. The Lord wants you to evangelize. Learn the Bible and evangelize at the same time. Come to church and evangelize at the same time. Do it.